Let's see. First item on the agenda is the minutes from the previous meeting. Any corrections or comments from anyone? They look fine to me. <clears throat> Mr. Emery. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that the uh, minutes be approved as written. Second. All those in favor, <laughs> please raise your right hand. <clears throat> okay, a number of items of uh, correspondence tonight. A memorandum from the town manager regarding the Fort Williams referral. A letter from code enforcement officer regarding Carew. Letter from S. Carter regarding Carew. Letter from town attorney regarding Dominica's Crossing. Um, memorandum from town manager regarding Dominica's Crossing. <clears throat> letter from Sprague Corporation regarding Ram's Head subdivision. Letter from town attorney regarding Highland subdivision. Letter from Albert Frick Associates regarding Lawton public ask, uh, access waiver. Memorandum from the fire chief regarding Lawton public access waiver. Zoning news, June 1996. On the podium tonight, <clears throat> we're on a few more. A letter to the planning board regarding um, the highlands from Bruce Gasquet. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, another letter from Chuck and Sandy Mintel regarding lot and public access waiver. And a letter from Susie Terry regarding <clears throat> construction traffic for the Dominica's Crossing project. A letter from Ann Kaplan, Five Winding Way, uh, regarding the Broad Cove Highland subdivision. Letter from T.Y. Lynn International regarding Ramshead Farm, amended subdivision plan. Public hearing notice regarding the Pedals and Pedestrians Committee report. And something from the Greater Port uh, Portland Council of Governments regarding debate on clear cutting referendum. And with that, we <clears throat> can move on to the first item on the agenda, which is a consent agenda item. And Maureen, could you? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, before we move on to that, uh, I have a conflict of interest in this matter and must recuse myself. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. McDonald own one of the lots in Stonegate, and they have purchased the abutting lot and gotten an easement for it and now have sold the lot to the Brighams. And what they want to do is eliminate one of the building envelopes so that they have a private backyard. Uh, the copy of the plan uh, in the application shows what the current approval is, and the applicant is, is requesting that you revise the subdivision plat with the amended building envelope. Are there any questions? I have a question. <clears throat> uh, are we? You will take care of it. Excuse us for a second. Just a question on the plot plan here. Uh, might I discuss that at this point? There's a change of uh, 7,245 square feet. And the drawing shows a strip approximately 200 feet long, and it would have to be 35 feet wide to come up to about 7,000 square feet. Am I miss missing something here? Yes, sir. Uh, what, what you ought to be doing is, excuse me, is looking at this plan right here. And what that will do is show you that the 
the boundary line between lot 11 and lot 10 took a right angle turn and we're not talking about exchanging just a strip of property but actually a whole triangle of property fine thank you any other questions or comments we hear a motion <laughs> Mr. Retzel. I have a motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and the materials submitted and the facts presented that the consent agenda be approved. Second. <clears throat> Thank you. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? Four to Janet, did you vote? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. It's unanimous. <clears throat> Next item is Dominicus Crossing Subdivision. Uh, request by Dominicus Crossing Limited Liability Company for preliminary subdivision approval and a wetlands alteration permit for 97 plus lot subdivision located off Wells and Sawyer Road. Section 16-2-4, major subdivision review, and section 19-3-9, wetland alteration permit. Do you wish to give any background at this point, or do you want to just listen to it? Just, just to summarize for the board, um, you've done site walks. You have deemed the application complete. You've had a public hearing. Um, at this point in the review, uh, you it's ripe for a decision if the board so chooses. Terry, <clears throat> would you like to begin? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to be back here. Hopefully this will be the last time in a while. Um, on June 18th, Maureen wrote a letter to us, which we responded last time at the previous uh, planning board meeting. And in front of you, you have a memo from us dated June 28th, 1996, which was submitted along with a number of maps and sketches outlining our responses that we talked about in person at the June 18th meeting. And so this is a way of formalizing some of the comments we made. It also contains some additional information and, of course, the maps that you have before you that have been, that were revised following the last meeting. Uh, some of these were out of um, response to the comments that we heard at the meeting and, and other reasons. And what I'd like to do is to uh, paraphrase and not go over every single point because it will take quite a while. Uh, there are 22 points on the memo uh, of June 28th. And uh, with your indulgence, I would just like to talk about the items that had any substantial changes that were made uh, between the last meeting and this meeting. And then turn it back over to you. Um, just as a point of interest, uh, there was a newspaper article in this morning's paper. Uh, contrary to the article, we have not changed the location of the project. It's still on Wells Road. <coughs> Uh, the name of the developer is Dominicus Crossing uh, Limited Liability Corporation. It is no longer the Navit Land Associates. And there are a couple other uh, details of the article, uh, which we hope um, are correct as we go through here. Um, so the, the first item that was submitted to you was a uh, sketch that was dated June 14th. It was 11 by 17 sketch, uh, lots 47 and 48. This is provided to talk about the issue of flag lots, knowing that uh, these two lots joined together will share a common driveway. We note in our application letter that as we go through and work out the details with the, the developer, that there will be a maintenance agreement uh, with uh, the two prospective homeowners that will be filed along with our final subdivision application. We've had conversations with the Boy Scouts. They are in agreement uh, relative to the location of the driveway and the need for an access easement. Again, those documents, those final documents will be submitted as part of the, the application. Um, the, the document that you have before you um, shows the location of the easement and it shows the approximate location of the driveway. And I 
think the rest of this is pretty self-explanatory. Number two is probably the area that we spent the most time on after the fairly lengthy discussion that we had relative to neighborhoods and layout of home, siting of, of structures in phase one. Um, I don't know if Peter's going to be here tonight, um, but I'll proceed without him. Uh, there are a number of issues that, were, uh, at, that we were asked to address relative to streetscape, solar orientation, public space, privacy, landscape detailing, driveways and service areas, preservation of landscape, in the name of creating neighborhoods. And since phase one, which of course will be uh, the first area off of Wells Road to be constructed, was the target of uh, many people's concerns, we amended the drawing, which was called Sheet 1, um, to show a number of changes with the uh, idea of showing uh, some more detail, and some more guidelines, uh, with the idea of um, showing how Anastas Alonis and uh, Dominicus Crossing LLC will reinforce this sense of neighborhoodness. Uh, I don't know if you want me to go into all the details right now. We can come back to this uh, later. But in working with, with Peter and Anastas and Lonis, uh, we did come up with a lot of guidelines, uh, a lot of statements that uh, will pertain to this particular phase uh, relative to those issues that we've just talked about. Um, at this point, I'll go on and we can, we can come back to that later if you have any specific questions. Okay, lot 92, uh, which is one of the, the big uh, lots up at the top here, um, is point number three in our, our memo. Again, that was mentioned last time as uh, it would be revised. And we, we're showing that in our revised site plan, um, preliminary site plan, which is again included as part of your uh, package. Uh, lot four is the lot on Wells Road uh, that will be retained uh, by Mr. Perez. The, the concern was raised last time about whether or not there should be access off, the well, off of Wells Road. Uh, we're saying at this point that access to this lot will be off the leash circle to avoid any additional traffic coming onto Wells Road at that point. Uh, we feel that a driveway can be located uh, in such a manner that it will be a, an asset to the development of that neighborhood, uh, Mr. Perez has indicated to us that uh, in the foreseeable future that will not be developed at some point. Of course, it will be, but uh, we're looking at an access driveway off the Palatia Circle to provide access to lot four. Uh, point five had to do with the Rodden Gun Club. As we mentioned last time, um, we uh, attempted to get some more information on the, the Rodden Gun Club. There was a, a question that was raised about the um, the types of weapons that were fired there. Uh, we made contact with a representative of the police department who informed us uh, that a variety of guns are discharged at the facility, rifles, shotguns, pistols, and so forth. Uh, to answer someone's specific question last time, how long would a bullet travel, how far would a bullet travel if it uh, was to go un unimpeded? Someone was to take a, a shotgun, or a, a rifle rather, at a 45 degree angle, uh, it would go approximately one mile. Um, however, in this particular case, there is a, a buffer of trees and a wooded hillside behind it. <clears throat> we did do a cross section uh, from the, the rifle range. Um, this is uh, Spurwink Road right here. Uh, sorry, rather. Uh, this is the uh, facility where they shoot from. Uh, the shooting is aimed in a downward direction. If you draw a cross section through the Rod and Gun Club to the top of the hill, you'll find that there's about uh, 60 feet of grade change, I believe, uh, from the area where the targets are to the top of the hill. Um, this is a, a diagram that was prepared at the request of the planning board. And we feel that this uh, illustrates the site conditions that are out there and uh, the sort of uh, backstop and buffer conditions that would separate the development uh, from the shooting that now occurs at the Rod and Gun Club. Uh, the issue of stormwater. Uh, the statements we made the last time relative to stormwater uh, have not changed at all. Uh, we've talked to Les Barry and he confirmed the statement that we made the last time. There will be no stormwater ponding on any of the sites. 
Uh, no, point number seven, building envelopes. Uh, we did uh, look at um, eight or 10 lots, uh, 66 through 93. Uh, a lot of changes were made to those lots. It's a matter of fine tuning to make sure that the building envelopes did not include little scraps of land that were cut off by wetlands or other site considerations. And so those building envelopes that are listed under point seven are, have all been squared up. Um, point eight, uh, again, a discussion we made last time for lots 44 and 45. Those lot lines, the buildable areas, have been modified to avoid the RP1 buffers on those two lots. Um, the point that was raised last time about driveway locations, we've added a symbol, a small solid triangle, to show the location of driveways on those particular lots, lots 10 through 94. Uh, we've noted that lots 33 and 75 may require a minor amount of wetland filling just off the edge of the road, but it is outside of the RP1 buffer. Uh, we did submit today a site location development permit and a natural resources uh, application to the DEP. A copy of it has been submitted moments ago to Maureen um, in requirements, to follow the requirements of the DEP. Uh, those filling areas were included as part of the application to DEP for uh, wetland alteration. Um, phasing, again, uh, lot 51 has been moved from phase three to phase four. Uh, point 12, community impact statement. Uh, Peter had mentioned last time that we would get some additional market profile information. That information was procured and was given to you as part of this package. Um, point 12, uh, the Wells Road Trail Connection statement is, uh, that we made last time still holds. That land that the trail connection to Wells Road is part of the common open space. Um, the point we made in uh, number 12, uh, number 13, uh, again, that has not changed. The Lorenzo Lane trail link with the Minix Crossing uh, still remains in place. We feel that's a logical place to put a trail, given the extension of the sewer line at that location. Uh, there was some concern raised last time about boardwalk locations. We have noted uh, in the revised trail plan, which you have a copy before you, that there will be a wetland treatment necessary in, in four additional areas, uh, as listed here. And again, we're making reference to the fact that we will be uh, working with the Conservation Commission uh, and our office, the Medicus Crossing, to lay out the final location and to decide the treatment of the trails at those specific points. In our application for the DEP, we calculated the amount of wetland disturbance on alteration that would be generated by the boardwalks or the, any other trail construction. Uh, we said that we'd probably be using boardwalks in most areas although we've left the door open in some places, we had to use uh, gravel fill as a, as a better alternative to be able to do that. as a fairly minor amount of wetland filling that's taking place because of the, uh, the trail construction. Uh, even though there's a boardwalk out there, DEP still considers it an alteration because there are shadows that fall on the surface of the, the wetlands uh, from the boardwalk. Uh, point 15, trail location, Dominicus Crossing will be responsible for all trail construction, even though we hope to enlist the services of the Boy Scouts and other service organizations. Uh, we have submitted a design uh, for the town green that was done uh, on sheet one. And this is a very preliminary sketch, uh, but it does show a treatment of the town green, this area that's, as we've talked about before, it's going to be constructed as part of phase one. There is a large pine tree on the northern end. There is a fairly uh, good sized oak tree at the uh, southeasterly south, uh, end. We hope to make the pine tree a feature of the area and to grade the area in such a way to provide a, a bowl shaped area so people using the space can sit here, enjoy the view out to, uh, to Spurwink Marsh and to create more of a backdrop for activities in that area. Uh, it's been always our intention to make this a very informal space, uh, one that will require a minimal amount of maintenance, but at the same time be a very attractive gateway into this part of the neighborhood. Um, the area will also be defined, as we've talked about, by a stone wall or a hedge on the, the westerly side and by uh, wooden fences on the other uh, three sides, as well as street tree plants. 
Um, let's see. Uh, there was some concern raised about lot, uh, lot two, the barn apartment. We have shown a, an envelope that will allow the barn apartment to expand in the future. That's certainly not the intention right now, but that was a concern that if uh, any expansion of that structure were to happen, what would it do to the vistas from the town green? We've indicated a, an envelope that will allow it to expand to the north, which really should not interfere with the view uh, from people standing up at the town green. And we've added a note to the preliminary site plan uh, showing that in the future, Lorenzo Lane and Layton Road uh, have been reserved with future road connections. That note, of course, will be transferred onto the final site plan and to the, and to the plat. So anybody buying homes in this area knows that it's the intent of the town uh, to have this roadway extended at some point in the future. Abutting buffering plans, uh, we just momentarily uh, got a sketch uh, from Susan Terrian that shows a listing of the plant materials and fencing designs. So uh, I think this indicates that, uh, at least on that front, we are making great progress in terms of working through the design, working with uh, her garden designer. Uh, so I think that we're approaching a point where uh, we are in agreement with what the, the backyard, the buffering, uh, will look like. Uh, in terms of the Mugar Clemens property, we've had several conversations and meetings that exchanged documents, and I am pleased to report that uh, as of some point this afternoon, there has been a, a positive conversation uh, between all parties involved. Um, we did submit a letter uh, to them. Uh, they submitted a, a letter back um, talking about a number of uh, points that they would like to see as part of the uh, agreement for buffering. Uh, it's the same process that we've been going through uh, with Susie Tarian. Uh, perhaps it's gotten a little bit more convoluted, but uh, we are at a point now where I think that we all are in agreement with the, the various points that we're uh, trying to agree upon. Uh, the, the final uh, points have not been finally uh, honed at this point, but it does address things like uh, buffering and setbacks, uh, the disposition of the, of the turnaround, uh, which is now uh, on our property, uh, some initial plantings, the, uses, the use of some additional berms, um, uh, some guarantees for the survival of buffer plantings and so forth. And we will be meeting uh, with Maureen on some of the provisions of these uh, this agreement, and that will be part of the final subdivision plan, which was presented to the planning board. Uh, Wells Road Reclamation, again, there was a lot of discussion about uh, the treatment of Wells Road. And you see a notice uh, in your package from the town manager. Uh, Mike McGovern met with, uh, with Juan and Peter and myself, uh, the public works director, and we are working out an agreement whereby an escrow account would be established at an, an amount to be set by the town manager and the public works director uh, that will go towards the eventual reclaiming and paving of approximately 2,200 linear feet of roadway, 22 feet in width. Uh, we will provide a trench cap so the, the road will certainly be usable and passable. Uh, it is not our intent right now to do an immediate reclamation uh, of Wells Road. There would be money set aside in an escrow account to allow the town to do that in the future. Uh, as we've talked about last time, there are a number of other issues that may be able to be dealt with, such as drainage, for example, which the town could deal with uh, using uh, the escrow account uh, provided by Dominicus Cross. Um, we have not made any additional comments relative to stone walls. Uh, the affordable housing issue has progressed to the point where we have uh, made some comments uh, and some have made additional contacts uh, with the town's attorney, and I believe you have a con copy of uh, Mr. Hill's comments back to Warren Turner, uh, which is uh, Peter Anastas' attorney. Uh, we feel that we are making great headway. We have not had a meeting uh, with Maureen uh, between last meeting and this. I think there is substantial progress being made relative to the points that were discussed at the last planning board meeting. At this point, uh, we feel that uh, the two attorneys are able to work out some of the uh, points of the agreement, and we will have this agreement in place when we come back before you for final subdivision approval. The last point, 22, is a, an idea that Mike McGovern had come up with at our meeting uh, when we talked about the, the road reclamation. Uh, it's been always Michael's uh, interest to make sure that there is at least one area uh, on the site where people can go to and find some 
small area for active recreation. After all, we do have places for passive recreation, strolling, walking, hiking, and so forth, but no place to go out and, and toss a basketball around. Uh, we are green, uh, green uh, and are offering to the town as part of the subdivision application uh, to look at a place uh, next to lot 57 in the Central Main Power Company right-of-way uh, where a half basketball court could be constructed as part of phase three. Uh, this is a very simple recreation facility. We've always talked about uh, making the space uh, available to the town as part of the development of, phase, of this phase. Uh, and we are agreeing to build it as part of phase three. This is a, a half basketball court with a backstop. It would not be lit. It would not have any parking spaces around it, no bleachers, uh, nothing fancy. It's a very simple area. It would be graded. Uh, a number of trees would probably have to be taken down uh, to put it in place. Um, we have not yet worked out the final design of it, but we will be providing that as part of the, the final subdivision application. So with that, uh, I will turn it back over to the chair. Uh, that, in uh, summary, is the information which we provided uh, in the June 28th memorandum to you. <clears throat> Thank you. Would anyone uh, wish to comment? <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Mr. Repsol. Could you just put the drawing back up of the um, rod and gun? What? Rod and gun club, yes. Shooting club. Is the, the vertical and the horizontal scale the same? That's correct, right. yes. It's a one to one. Yeah, I would have guessed the terrain was more pronouncing that, so I'm a little surprised. Do you know what the angle is from, from a horizontal where they shoot from to, the, say, the top of that hill? I, and don't, what the I don't know. It's probably uh, 15 degrees or so. And people are shooting down like that, uh, to go up like that. I, I, I had asked most of the questions regarding this, and I, I thought I'd been fairly specific uh, about um, concern about the velocity of bullets at the, at the range of where the I don't know, five or six different house lots at about 1,200 feet. Um, where, where would those houses, where would those billing envelopes be um, in relation to the crown of that hill um, that, you, that you see to the right-hand side? We're looking about anywhere from 1,000 to, yeah. I realize this, it's sort of going to This uh, point crescent. here is... Uh, this crest hill here is the hill that's in back here. The shooting range is from here, and it's the section is taken directly through here, the hills right here. These house lots back here are um, a little over a thousand feet away from here. At, 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 you know. mm -hmm. did, did you find out what the velocity of a bullet is uh, of the typical rifle they shoot there at a thousand feet? The, the police officer that we spoke to didn't give us that information. Okay. Uh, that's what I had asked for as far as the safety <coughs> issue. Uh, you know, how dangerous is it for houses to be a thousand feet away from uh, uh, the source of where they're shooting from? I understand that it would take an error, uh, but I think your policeman will tell you um, probably 90 percent of the fatalities uh, relating to guns are, are because of a, an error. Something goes wrong. Uh, I, I don't feel it, it, that that information is, is quite, easy, quite easy to get from uh, firearms companies and, and, and the companies that produce um, cartridges for rifles, whether it's Winchester or, or Marlin or any of those companies that have that foot velocity uh, at, at distances and on charts. Um, that's what I was looking for, and I realize it travels to about a mile, but when a bullet falls at a mile, it's at, at the end of its velocity, it's falling a, a, like a stone would fall. It, it's not necessarily dangerous. I guess it's also a function of what kind of bullets are fired out. Right. There are a number of different uh, weapons that are discharged out. And I'm always, always only concerned about rifles. I mean, I've been shot numerous times by shotgun pellets. Uh, most people who shoot the, on a, a game farm have, have been shot. If you're out several hundred, couple hundred yards, so 400 yards, it falls like rain, like hard rain on you. It's, it doesn't hurt. But rifles are a different issue from shotguns. Um, and, and so that, that's a concern. It's, it's, it's strictly a safety issue. It's really a concern House. of ours also. I think, uh, you know, our concern is always going to be there. Uh, 
I guess, I, I guess let's get beyond the concern. I don't feel that you've substantially uh, satisfied the ordinance uh, as it pertains to public safety until you can tell us what the velocity of a bullet is at 1,000 feet away from a, uh, a gun club. I think that's a reasonable request. It's not a difficult piece of information to, to give us. Mr. Emery? Uh, yes. Uh, thank the applicant for the additional information and the guidelines. Um, <clears throat> quite a while ago, we had asked for sort of an illustrative site plan that dealt with the issues that I think you're trying to describe in the guidelines. And uh, you've given, <clears throat> excuse me, you've provided a conceptual plan or theoretical arrangement of buildings on sheet one uh, with the latest revisions. And in, in many cases, uh, what you're proposing in your guidelines are consistently illustrated in the plan. Um, I've seen, in the last week, I've seen two issues that raise concern with respect to cluster development in, in these size lots. Uh, one is an advertisement in the paper that Anastas had for, I think it's Pheasant Hill, uh, which showed a um, well, sort of a Dutch colonial or Queen Anne uh, uh, shingle-style house with a low profile, story and a half, maybe uh, the maximum height. At the same time, I recently traveled through uh, the Falmouth Country Club and seen some enormous building envelopes uh, with little regard to the adjacent houses. Uh, and uh, I'm not aware that any of those were, were being constructed by uh, the applicant, although the applicant does have houses under construction in, in uh, uh, Falmouth Country Club. Uh, so I, I guess it's with um, some concern that, that uh, we don't have more guidelines or uh, a clearer uh, indication uh, of what's going to happen in the unique neighborhoods that, that differentiate one neighborhood from another. I think it, there's, a, there's a potential, uh, and again, one never really knows until the site's fully cleared and buildings start to rise one next to the other. But I think there's a potential for some uh, really excellent construction and, and nice public spaces. And then, uh, as the chairman had expressed earlier, a concern for houses that overpower the lot um, that are just regardless of all of the good notions of minimum setbacks and minimum side setbacks are just out of scale with, with uh, a particular neighborhood. Um, I don't know. It doesn't appear to me that we're going to get anything that specific. I know that the applicant and many, and many builders prefer to um, let each homeowner, uh, as is their right, particularly in, in uh, single-family residential construction, to determine what it is they'd like to do with a lot within those guidelines. I can only say, in particular with the uh, previous um, conflict of interest that I expressed, that I, I have done one uh, house site in Stonegate and found the, the market that uh, was attracted to that neighborhood having a difficult time jostling houses in to get the outside uh, spaces that they desired within that marketplace, along with the privacy uh, and, and usable areas, uh, including sort of uh, celebration of front yards and, and uh, family gathering areas in the back, uh, formal gardens, those sorts of issues. And uh, I think I'd hope to at this point, although it's not going to, uh, it will not change uh, how I vote on this matter for preliminary subdivision, I'd hope to have more direction, I think, and creativity from the applicant uh, with respect to those issues. Uh, the only other question I would, I would raise with, with the Rod and Gun Clubs, uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Etzel noted earlier uh, that shotgun shells are not as much of concern as, as, uh, as a bullet. Uh, but just uh, I'm curious as to whether or not they uh, do shoot, uh, skeet shooting or uh, shoot clay pigeons at the uh, Rod and Gun Club. Our understanding that they only uh, do target practice, target. They, they, and they're com usually confined to a small building there. Yeah. Okay. That's all. Okay. I guess what I'd like to also uh, add is, uh, as one board member, I'd like to encourage that this uh, we move forward with this this evening, uh, in one way or another. <clears throat> Mr. Russell. Chair, the one last last issue, and um, um, I guess so that I don't go through this um, needlessly. 
The applicant is still proposing six affordable housing units. Is that correct? I did, July 8th, I didn't know whether I was going to be here or not, and I, I wrote a letter um, to the planning board uh, members, and then after I finished it on July 8th, I, I felt that it may be a case of ex parte communication if I sent it directly there. I ask uh, your permission to, to read this letter into the, it's just my uh, um, concerns about the, the affordable housing. <coughs> just to read it into the. Please go ahead. Okay. July 8, 1996, dear planning board colleagues, I decided to write this letter assuming that most of you would not want to hear me ramble on in a public meeting about my personal feelings regarding complying with our affordable housing ordinance in Dominica's Crossing. I've stated all along that the applicant, by proposing six units, is short of the required number of affordable housing units with little or no support uh, from other board members. I feel responsible to a point for the situation we're in. At one of the early workshop meetings, I offered a third, as a third alternative that the applicant could come up with a balance of low and moderate income housing units as a creative solution to the ordinance dictated alternatives. I objected at a later meeting to the methodology of how the applicant came up with six units versus eight units, but the applicant came back with a blending of percentages, all of the combinations which were not, uh, of which were not a 50-50 balance. Unfortunately, we allowed some mathematical mumbo-jumbo to get us off track with from anything but a 50-50 balance, which no matter how calculated equates to seven and a half units, rounded to eight total units from the suggested balance of low and moderate income unit approach. I firmly believe we have an obligation to uphold the existing ordinance with A, 5% of the total units uh, of low income units, or B, 10% of total units of moderate income units. According to a recent discussion with our town assessor, the average value of a single family home in Cape Elizabeth is still in the $150,000 to $160,000 range, which adds, adds a questionable twist to option B, but at least the 10 units would satisfy the ordinance and be an incredibly positive benefit to the housing stock. Option A, five units of truly affordable homes, epitomizes what we should hope for in this development's contribution to the betterment of this community. The third suggestion, which I'm now sorry I ever brought up, of eight units of a balance of two types of units technically doesn't specifically satisfy the ordinance, but at the time I thought it was a fair alternative. I will suggest if the applicant wants to shortcut the number of units of affordable housing offered as an alternative to the ordinance with only a total of six units, then we should return to one of the ordinance required alternatives mentioned in A or B above. I know that the survey from the comprehensive plan that indicates the majority of Cape Elizabethans don't favor affordable housing will and has been thrown back in my face. But this town should be proud of the fact that we had a town council at the time that saw past the elitism of the majority view and required, some, required that economic diversity, at least through housing, be returned, albeit in a small way, for the common good. Again, I urge that we require 5% of the total units in low-income units 10 or 10% I'm sorry, 10% of the total units of moderate income use, or perhaps lastly, eight units of an even mix of moderate and low income units. Enough preaching, vote as you will. Sincerely, Steve Etzel. Thank you. So be it. Any other comments? <clears throat> well, I certainly would like to comment um, on Steve's last proposal. I'd also like to to echo the comments with concern about the, the Rod and Gun Club, but with respect to the affordable housing issue, my recollection of it was that uh, Steve did bring up the affordable housing issue and the, the count at a meeting perhaps three times ago. I don't have a clear sense of this, three or four times ago. And I thought that the... Uh, I, I certainly remember talking uh, in support of Steve's concern at that point, um, and I thought that I remembered that we were going to revisit that issue in a clear way. Now, I don't know what has happened since then, but um, it doesn't feel like it is left in a, in a, uh, uh, a clear way at this point. And perhaps we could have some elucidation from other board members if my recollection is inaccurate. I don't recall. <clears throat> Unfortunately, neither do I. Not the specifics. I remember the discussion, but not the specifics of it.
question for the town planner, possibly. <laughs> in, in your interpretation, um, mm -hmm. have they met the? Um, I do remember the board having a, a lengthy discussion about how you calculate the numbers. Um, I do believe at a subsequent meeting we talked about affordable housing generally, and no one brought up the calculation other than Steve again. Um, so it has been raised a couple of times. Um, I have talked to the applicant about this. Uh, this particular calculation is in the zoning ordinance. If there is a disagreement about how to interpret the zoning ordinance, uh, the board that is allowed to make those interpretations is the zoning board. And I've suggested to the applicant that if they wanted to resolve this in a permanent manner, they could take this particular question to the zoning board. I believe their choice was to, to stay with the planning board and uh, try to get a consensus of this board on what you felt the appropriate calculation was. Uh, is it possible to uh, make this a condition of uh, whatever motion is passed or offered up this evening to have it resolved with a mutual agreement of the applicant and the uh, town planner and the code enforcement officer for a review thereafter by the planning board? I assume that's okay, isn't it? I would. I really think at this point that that the town staff need direction from the board. It's a matter of interpretation that yeah. the staff should not be making. Welcome. Yeah. From my recollection at the time, the way the way it was presented by the applicant was that it was a proportional split. And if you had two neighborhoods within this overall development, one neighborhood of 80 units and one neighborhood of 20 units, and you said neighborhood A of 80 units generates four low-income housing units, and neighborhood B of 20 units generates two moderate income housing units, and there you have a total of six. And the board at that time sort of noted that in passing. We, we could always go back to a point where we had five low income units. We felt, though, that in keeping with the spirit of diversity and spreading the units out, that we wanted to to offer a little bit more than just those basic five units. And so we decided to drop five down to four, and by your own calculation, it almost looks like it's either one of, one of this or two of that. We felt that by that understanding of the ordinance, that one low-income unit was really equivalent to two moderate-income units, which, of course, is how we arrived at the point we're at right now. We feel it's a very equitable way of doing it. If you end up with more affordable housing, we could always go back to the, the five low income. <clears throat> Mr. Ruffle? I say one more thing. <laughs> I, I, if that's the offer, I, I think we'd, as a community, we'd be much better off with five low income homes than six of the blend. I mean, I, you, you gave the example of the the mathematical mumbo jumbo that uh, that that I mentioned. Um, if it's a straightforward 50-50 blend between the two types of um, housing, it always comes out to seven and a half units. Um, I don't want to get into that. Um, I, I said in my letter that uh, the other two alternatives are, are better than mm -hmm. six units of, of the blend. I think we would prefer to keep it the way we have it right now. I think we need a flip chart. At this point, I'm very fuzzy on what we have and what we uh, say we're supposed to have and, and uh, so forth. We've offered that. And what in the our language of the ordinance is, because it's been a while since I've reviewed that. Yeah, the uh, calculations are back in the pile of materials, but I didn't come prepared to debate the calculation this evening. That's one reason I wanted to make it a condition. Maureen is uh, in, on the way to get a flip chart. <laughs> oh, what did I say? <clears throat> Any other comments while we're waiting?
those who might be listening at home, we're taking a brief break while the town planner gets a flip chart. It's on page nine of section two, in case any of you have the big book. said they have 80 units and they're providing low-income units out of that is 5%. So that equals four low-income units. Then they've also taken the other out of the 100, the 20 units, and out of that they're taking moderate-income units and they need 10%. So that equals two moderate income units for a total of six. Now, I believe the, the other way to look at it is to take the 100 units and to look at, we say that you need to make moderate income has to be 10% of the total number of units. Low income has to be 5% of the total number of units. So if you blend that together, it's it's you need twice as many low income to make up the moderate income. So if, if you go with 100 units, you have five moderate income, two and a half low income. That means seven and a half units, which you have to convert to eight. Mm -hmm. Correct? But then there's another way to read it which is the language of the ordinance itself, which says all major subdivisions shall, all major subdivisions taken as whatever is a major subdivision shall set aside at least 10% of the lots units in the project as affordable housing for moderate income buyers or 5% of the lots units in the project as affordable housing for low income buyers. It doesn't have any something about the blended. So it's according to the strict language in the ordinance, it would be either 10% as moderate, which would be 10 units, or 5% as low income, which would be five. Yet another way to read it. Uh, the, the column on, on the on the left, the right hand side is basically what the ordinance says, um, and Janet read from the ordinance. On, on the left hand side, and as I said, I'm sorry I ever brought it up uh, as far as, because it, whether it's 80 units or 20 units, that's 80 percent and 20 percent, it doesn't matter uh, whether it's 5 percent and 95 percent or 40 percent and 60 percent, if it's not 50-50, if it's not an equal amount of those two units, it will always come out six. Uh, I'm not a mathematician. I just, or it will come, it will not come out to seven, to seven and a half rounded eight. I'm sorry. I'm not a mathematician, but no matter how many times you do it, that's the way it will come out. Um, that, like I said, <coughs> enough said.
Any additional comments on this? Or I have an additional well, comment. I, th I think it's, it's basically a, uh, an interpretation of the ordinance as to whether uh, the planning board can set a, this sort of a policy of uh, variable amounts of sort of uh, numbers of units that have, in effect capitalize the uh, low and moderate units. It, it, it is, in, in fact, on a sliding scale where if you were to look at it at the other extreme of uh, 20 units, if you will, leveraging one low income unit and 80 units leveraging eight, that would give a total of nine. So there are any number of, of combinations that range from, from nine all the way down to five, depending upon how you, you know, how you approach looking at, you know, if it is possible to interpret the ordinance and, or implement the ordinance, if you will, in that fashion. That's the scale that we've pointed out on page nine of section two, where it goes from either five low and zero moderate to zero low to 10. And we're saying that you know, using this scale, that it is possible to go either five or six, seven, eight, nine, or 10. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Emery. Um, with, with all due respect to backpedaling on this issue, uh, from, the, from a planning board member's standpoint, I feel as though I have to sort of address it anew as it's been uh, brought up this evening. I'm wondering, in the interest of time and fairness and, and whatever else, there seems to be a range of five to ten units if we don't strike a balance in the middle, uh, which would be consistent with the chart that the applicants provided. If you draw a line, unfortunately, there are three above and three below that line, uh, which gives us somewhere between seven and eight units. And then the board, I think, has to uh, consider whether it's more interested in a higher number of moderate income units or a higher number of low income units to develop the total. Um, but are you suggesting that the minimum number of units on affordable housing would be eight? Somewhere between seven and eight, that's correct. If we were to do a blend. Excuse me? If we were to do a blend. <clears throat> that's correct. Which is I, part of the, uh, the six unit proposal is indeed a blend. Right. Yeah. What I'm trying to do, Terry, is just get this off the dime and uh, if the board is going to get hung up on yeah on uh, six not being enough, I'd like to at least propose an option where it, uh, we can meet in the middle here and uh, the developer doesn't have to. Uh, I, th I think we're really going to get hung up on this. We'll, we'll withdraw our, 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 our number of six and go down to five low income units and simply satisfy the terms of the ordinance without asking for any further discussion. I, for one, would say that that was more advantageous than accepting six the way they are now. I agree. Okay. So the proposal is five <coughs> low-income units. Okay. Low-income. That's correct. Yes. That's correct. Okay. <coughs> Anything else on that or something else? Um, <clears throat> as you may or may not be aware, I was not here for the last meeting, and I have, I have some questions uh, regarding your June 28th uh, memorandum or letter, and some of them were very simple, because I just don't know what the terms mean, and some of the other things are comments. Um, number one, flag lots. I don't know if there was a discussion about this or not. <clears throat> it seems to be somewhat unwieldy and complicated to... Um, have two lots and the Boy Scouts all have to do documentation just for a simple walkway. It seemed to be much simpler just to relocate the walkway someplace else. We've, we've moved it several times and this is one that, that seemed to be acceptable to the Boy Scouts. It avoided wetlands. It gave a, an access uh, to the Boy Scouts at a point of their property that they felt was uh, best to accommodate their concerns. They told us that they only use this uh, a very limited number of times during the year, somewhere between one and three times a year. This is not going to be something that will be used every day or every weekend. So the amount of traffic that we're anticipating uh, 
seems like would justify um, a minor inconvenience over a, a private driveway. Okay, un no, umber, excuse me, um, under number two, streetscape, uh, there's a line in the um, that paragraph that kind of worries me a little bit. It says no two homes in a row will be identical. <laughs> it sounds to me like there may be a skip of a house than another house that was just like the one two houses before. And that to me is, um, I don't know, it seems like it could, be, it could be better done than that. And the house could be not identical. The, you could have, you wouldn't be picking model A, B, C, D, or E. You could get something that was a little bit different. Then on the other hand, you could have three houses all in a row, and it could be very delightful that were identical. Oh, that were the same? Yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> Some people like row houses. <laughs> yeah, but those aren't row houses. These no. are detached housing. Um, I'm going to, you know, hit three similar right. good houses. Excuse me. Three similar good houses are better than th three unsimilar lousy houses. Well, excuse I don't, me for interrupting. You know, the builder that's in partnership with the landowner is anything but a lousy builder. He's a mm -hmm. uh, builder. Not, so I'm not, not expecting uh, that. Insinuating that anything but, but the best. Um, <clears throat> Okay, a couple other things. Um, I've made them this comment before. I'm just going to say it again. I don't need a reaction. I think the lots are too small in phase one. I think it's going to be a problem. Um, under landscape detailing, a couple of questions. Um, let's see. Nastas and Lawrence will encourage the use of appropriate landscape detailing that will reinforce the feel of a small scale neighborhood. These may include fences, light standards, Stone walls, front and side yard flower gardens. How on earth are you going to make a homeowner plant flower gardens? We use the word encourage. Excuse me? We use the word encourage. Right. <clears throat> and the next thing, having been involved in developments before, are you going to be able to have individual mailboxes or mailboxes two on a post, or are you going to have to use cluster boxes? I believe we're going to uh, be relying upon. Uh, app home delivery. Excuse me? Uh, I believe we're going to have app home delivery. We're not going to have gang mailboxes. And so the post office is going to individually go to each house? I believe that's the, yeah. the way we're planning on having mail delivered. Okay. <clears throat> um, the Rod and Con Club issue uh, worries me as well. I don't know how it's going to be a fair way to protect the public from that slim chance that someone is going to have a problem. Um, but I encourage you to find something that's imaginative. I, I didn't hear the first part of your comment. The Rod and Gun Club. The Rod and Gun Club issue worries me. Um, I've shot there a number of times as a, as a kid. I used to go sight my deer rifle in there. And um, I don't think any of my shots ever went above the berm, but that's not to say that um, someone else's wouldn't. And let's see. Okay, a quick question. The present width of um, Wells Road, paved width, do you know what that is? 21 to 22 feet, I believe. Um, it says in number 18, um, abutting buffering plans, and I was sort of listening to see if you answered this or not. Uh, it says by the meeting on July 16th, we should be able to report on some of the specific provisions, including the disposition of the turnaround for the Muter Clements property. I didn't hear a real definite answer on that. We haven't Did come to a final agreement. Um, our okay. attorney has talked with their attorney. I think that we are in agreement in principle. Okay. All right, one last thing. Um, the market profile report. I don't know if anyone paid any attention to the numbers in this. Um, under population and households, um, the 2001 population of Cape Elizabeth done by someone, I don't know who this, these people are or where they're located, it's the information decision systems, but I don't know where they are. It says that the population of Cape Elizabeth will be 9,210 people. And currently, in 1996, we have 9,206 people. In five years of building houses, we're going to have four more people. I find this kind of hard to swallow. So I, I went, went to that. I went down to the 2001 households. 
of 3,422 houses. In 1996, we have 3,405, a difference of 17 houses. We have a really long build-out for this project. So I, I just submit that this whole market profile report is um, basically worth we, less we than what we paid, paid for. for. That's it. <clears throat> Any other comments? Questions? No, I'll just apologize to the chair for interrupting. I got uh, caught up in the moment. No problem. <clears throat> what would the board like to do? I'd like to propose a motion. <clears throat> Uh, motion for the board to consider findings of facts. Uh, one, the Dominicus Crossing Limited Liability Company is requesting preliminary subdivision approval and wetland alteration permit for a 97 lot plus one multifamily unit subdivision located off Wells Road and Sawyer Road. The application was deemed complete February 20th, 1996. A public hearing was held March 19th, 1996, and three site walks have been held by the planning board. Three, the, application has the applicant has responded to planning board concerns with additional concept plans and designs that have not been incorporated into technical drawings and submitted for town review. Four, this development requires review from other governmental agencies that could result in changes to the plan. Five, the subdivision plan substantially complies with section 16-3-1, standards for subdivision design, and section 19-3-9, wetlands regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Dominicus Crossing Limited Liability Company for preliminary subdivision approval and a preliminary wetland alteration permit for Dominicus Crossing, a 97 lot plus one multifamily unit located off Wells Road and Sawyer Road, be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that this preliminary approval is based on submitted concepts plans which must be revised and made consistent with technical drawings prior to an application for final subdivision review. Two, that the approval by the DEP and any other governmental agencies be obtained prior to submitting an application for final subdivision review. Clear a second. I'll second it, Chairman. All those in favor, please. Do we have some discussion? discussion? <laughs> 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 Trying to hurry it along. Go ahead, Mr. Wilcox. Okay. Anyone Thank wish to comment? Mr. Chair, I was just wondering if we we should or would like offer to the applicant uh, if the applicant feels we should enter into some discussion as to whether uh, condition one uh, covers the eventuality of adjusting the plans for the fact that the applicant has just offered to have five low-income units as opposed to four plus two. I would imagine that there could be involved with the process of making that change some adjustment of lot lines and or adjustment of unit count for the entire project. Good point. And it obviously would need to be incorporated into the plans before they went to DEP, but uh, I was just well, wondering. Plans are at DEP. And oh, plans well, whatever. Before the it'll approval be, from DEP. It will be a process and we will be submitting, okay. I'm sure, more than one amendment to them as we go through that process. Any other comments? Ms. Retzel? Mr. Chair, I, just to explain that I, I will not be voting in favor of the motion. Um, and, and based on, on the fact that, that I sincerely believe that the applicant hasn't uh, uh, substantially complied with um, the safety issue with the Rod and Gun Club, I, I think um, it's been a while before we've dealt with a major subdivision. And, and historically, uh, major subdivisions take numerous votes uh, to move forward. Uh, in a process to, to not vote in favor of a motion does not deny uh, a, the applicant. And we have three options we can approve, table, or deny. Uh, 
I will not be voting in favor because I still think it is the burden of the applicant to prove the issue of, of public safety uh, for those lots within 1,000 to 1,400 feet uh, of an errant shot from, from the gun club. I think it's, the, it's easily obtainable information. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't see that uh, another 30 days is going to substantially hold up um, 100 lot subdivision uh, simply to improve the safety uh, for, the, for the general public. Um, and, and I think it is, it's, it's the job of this board to not move it ahead until we've met those, especially those issues of not uh, picking uh, whether we like the way it has uh, been developed or not, uh, but substantial uh, compliance with the ordinance. Um, and therefore, I will not be, uh, I would be in favor of tabling it for 30 days for them to come back with that information. Any further comments, discussion? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, I, first of all, would like to ask Mr. Edsel if, he's, if he is um, content with the community impact statement issue. That's something we've spent some time on. We did get something from the applicant this time. Uh, I agree that it, it wasn't uh, really worth asking for, but um, I wanted to make sure that we weren't sliding by something that we have spent a fair amount of time on before. Uh, if you're looking for an answer whether I'm satisfied, no, I'm not satisfied with it. Um, I felt like I, we were all put in, in a kind of a difficult situation in that um, prior to it coming before the board, um, the, the Cape Courier published uh, the town manager saying that it was a, a reasonable impact study uh, and it should be sufficient to satisfy the needs of the town. Uh, and I didn't, uh, I pushed it a little bit, but I didn't feel that I was in a position to contradict the town manager. That's why I dropped the issue. I guess I had two other concerns. One is the safety issue. The other is that I, for one, am uh, somewhat disappointed with the design guidelines, as the applicant has indicated. Uh, it, the language is basically in terms of encouraging. I thought at one point that we had requested that there be more of a sense of um, some unifying concept that would distinguish this subdivision and was hoping for more than uh, what has been produced, but um, perhaps that further uh, development can occur at the, at the final subdivision review level rather than the preliminary subdivi uh, review subdivision level. Um, And finally, I was interested in a proposal which I guess has just been made tonight uh, by letter about request to lower the impact of construction on the Wells Road development. Um, if the applicant will refresh my memory about when the breakthrough to the Sawyer Road connection is going to be made with respect to the current phasing, I'd appreciate it. That will be made part of uh, phase four. So the first three phases right. will phase, be. Phase one uh, goes up to this point right here. Right. Two phase is Lorenzo. Phase two is that road that goes over to the Birchnell. Phase three is a fairly short Small. section right here. And phase four will bring it down to that point. Phase five, of course, will be the last phase. Those are the extent of my comments. Mr. Emery? I'd like to follow up on the issue of phasing as well. Um, uh, it has been mentioned more than once that the uh, irony here is that perhaps phase five, the, the houses, the large lot houses on top of the hill will sell first, or at least the market uh, will be available there than, than perhaps elsewhere in the development. Uh, it's probably not a bad situation to be in to have a, a large house, expensive house market uh, immediately available. But a question to the town planner, let's say phase one is, is under construction and phase five is uh, unavoidable. There are people beating down uh, everyone's doors to get property in Cape Elizabeth on top of the hill with a view of the marsh. Uh, at what point uh, would an abutter on Wells Road have to uh, 
would, would one get relief? Can houses be uh, uh, constructed using a, a rough uh, access road to get up there? Can lots be offered for sale without uh, the road under construction? My point is that it would seem to me uh, preeminently unfair to have the abutters on Wells Road living through phase five as one of the first construction phases without breaking through to Sawyer Road to gain access there. Uh, and I'd almost like to uh, propose that, uh, and perhaps the ordinance would require it anyway, that before any construction is initiated in phase five, that, uh, or even earlier phases, that construction access is provided from Sawyer Road. I'm not talking about a full-fledged road for uh, uh, public access, but one that, which would be considered typically a construction road suitable for trucks and uh, four-wheel drive vehicles? Uh, usually the phasing of a project is uh, something the board does spend a lot of time on. Usually you spend more time on it during the final subdivision approval. Um, in the past, and I would urge you as part of final subdivision approval, you, you fix the sequency, sequencing of phases, and there are good reasons to do that, the, the primary one being access but also infrastructure. That answers the first question. I can't guarantee that there aren't going to be ordinance changes at some point in the future that are going to allow what you are proposing. Um, but it would always be my strongest recommendation not to allow any activity in an area where the town does not have a guarantee posted. Because if they were working in phase one and they wanted to get into phase four and you don't have the guarantee in place, and the reason we, we break these phases up is because it gives the, the applicant the advantage of not having to post a huge guarantee all at once. At the same time, I don't really think it protects the town's interest if you're working in an area where the town does not have a guarantee where they can go in and fix a problem in case the developer um, does not perform. And the phase five is problematic because it's so far away from any, any existing town road, it, it, would never, it would never meet our dead-end road standard. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Russell? One last comment uh, regarding the um, word escapes me now, resurfacing of, of Wells Road. Um, I, again, I think we're, we're missing a, a real opportunity to, without the requirement of uh, um, um, a purchase of additional property or easements simply by widening the surface. Um, um, but I, I, again, um, it seems that there's been an agreement made with the, the town already uh, simply to replace the 22-foot wide surface. Um, I, th I just think that we're, we're missing an opportunity. Um, yeah, I guess I'll let that one fly as well. An opportunity? Simply by, by adding four feet to the surface and not even asking that the applicant uh, uh, pay for that. There's already made your agreement with the town manager how much uh, you're going to put in escrow to resurface the 22 feet. I'm just saying that, that, that we could have an opportunity to have a 26-foot wide uh, <coughs> surface and, and realign that with a shared, shared shoulder. That's what I want to say. Yeah, I, uh, as we pointed out last time, it's not quite that simple, though, because if we were to go with the 26-foot wide road, then there are implications that may affect the, uh, the speed or the appearance of Wells Road. So I guess what we're saying is that here is a, a sum of money that will be that available exactly. to you, yeah, and, and how you want to use it uh, is really up to the town. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and that, that deal's already been struck. So, uh, it's, it's on the table. Mr. Chairman, I apologize for continuing the discussion, but uh, one item uh, triggers further, I think warrants further discussion. Uh, uh, at face value, the, the sum of $25,000 seems uh, low to me to do an overlay of, of Wells Road. Uh, the, the number of feet that are, that are mentioned, I saw the uh, Public Works Director's calculations and the price per ton for uh, the material, which seemed to be uh, Within the, within the recent range, uh, but something just doesn't seem to add up. Uh, I would assume that as we get into more detailed review of the uh, final plans, that if anything should uh, come up with a recalculation, that the notion here is that the agreement is based on uh, the total width of road and length of road, and that the uh, number will continue to float until such time as uh, uh, the final prices can be set at the uh, final approval, for example. 
I'd, I'd like to just have the number double checked. I guess that's what I'm saying, and it'd be clear on exactly what it includes. I saw. Uh, I didn't see any major road reconstruction. I saw taking up the base, uh, the asphalt, uh, redoing that, putting down a base asphalt, the finish asphalt. But I didn't see any numbers being carried for drainage work or uh, uh, road reconstruction. The the deal that's been struck is is only for surface treatment. Then I would understand. That's correct. Mm -hmm. and that, that's what was done five years ago when the road was reconstructed. Mm -hmm. and that was what the public works director had requested us uh, to look at, and that was his recommendation as to how it should be best be treated. And it was his recommendation also that it not be uh, resurfaced immediately, but it should be given a couple of years to resettle after the, the trench has been camped. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chair, I would like to um, propose an amendment to uh, condition number one. as follows, that this preliminary approval is based on, and I'd like to insert here, written and oral representations by the applicant and, and then continue with the conditions that are here now, submitted concept plans which must be revised, and this is the second place I'd like to insert some words to incorporate the applicant's representations and made consistent with technical drawings, etc. I have no objection. I need a second. Stand we point to second the motion. I think Roy has to um, yes. approve. Can you just repeat that, Janet, please? Sure. Let, let me read all of number one. Yes. That this preliminary approval is based on written and oral representations by the applicant and submitted concept plans, which must be revised to incorporate the applicant's representations and made consistent with technical drawings prior to an application for final subdivision review. I'll second that. Okay, one last comment, um, sort of following up on the town market profile, uh, profile report. It sort of gave me a funny feeling that uh, figures are so flawed in the beginning, I realized that probably, you know, this could have been spun out of anyone's computer based on a model of a town of 8,600 people in a, in a primarily white-collar town. So it doesn't seem to me, to me that it's really met our request for what we asked for. And I had been kind of looking forward to this as uh, something that would really tell us something. It really doesn't tell us anything because I don't think the, the numbers are accurate. And even if they are, I'm not really, I haven't studied them enough. Because again, I didn't think the figures were accurate. But, um, to look at the, you know, the school age children by male and female and education, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I, I sort of took that as a, I'm assuming someone read this before it was submitted. If someone read it, still submitted it, it would have been better not to submit it because it's almost sort of an insult. Um, so just to let everyone else know as well, I, I cannot possibly vote for um, this to be approved tonight. There just seems to be some missing elements in the review of Mr. Etzel with the public safety issue. Um, there's something that needs to be addressed before we can proceed, I believe. The last time we, we talked about community impact, there was a request that was made by the town uh, to have comments made on our application um, by the school department. Right. And has there been any comments uh, at this point? Has anyone asked? There has been a request, yes. By whom? By me. And In writing. And it fell on deaf ears. I wouldn't say that. I would say that it wasn't a priority. <laughs> and there's been a change of command. 
you know, it would be interesting to have that. It may, um, yep. it may prove that this market profile report has some, sub has some validity, or it may prove that it has no validity. But without something, um, anyway, I don't want to belabor that. Is it time to bring this to a vote? Yes. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Three. All those opposed, please raise your right hand. Okay. Now what do we do? It fails. It fails. Need another motion. I need another motion. <coughs> Mr. Chair, I have a motion. Um, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Dominicus Crossing Limited Liability Company for preliminary subdivision approval and a preliminary wetland alteration permit for Dominicus Crossing, a 97 lot plus one multifamily unit located off Wells Road and Sawyer Road be tabled to the regular August the 20th, 1996 meeting of the Planning Board with the consent of the app. I'll second that. <clears throat> Any further discussion? I guess you might want to ask the con whether the applicant's consent is well, the applicant at hand. I guess I would like some, I, I've heard very specifically information uh, on the safety issue. Uh, I guess I'm very confused, though, what we're looking for uh, on the market information. I think we've done a tremendous job in giving you data. Uh, Peter was the one that got this information. Uh, it was a, a source that he's used in the past that he's used for making decision on locating restaurants uh, and other facilities. Um, and I'm assuming that he looked at it. Um, I, I'm not a statistician. I, I do not know. Uh, how to explain the variances in numbers. Um, I, th I think that we've done as good a job as we can relative to community impact. We've asked for a, a review by the town, by the school department, and I'm assuming that they saw something that was grossly uh, of concern to them that they would have responded to us. Excuse me for a second. Has the school department seen this market so far? This most recent report, no. They saw the, the previous, they, they've seen everything the applicant generated using their own numbers. We realized that when we gave it to you, uh, it probably wasn't worth the paper that was printed out. But we said that we would submit it to you, uh, and here it is. And uh, I think that we would prefer to have uh, the project uh, reviewed based primarily upon the information that's before you already. This is meant just to be supplemental. Okay. Uh, sorry. Excuse me. Uh, the question is still, I guess, before you. Um, will you consent to a tabling if that's how the board votes? That's correct. Yeah, that would be agreeable to us. Mr. Russell? Um, I, I guess I'll hold my comments until after a vote. I was going to comment on the impact study. That's all. Okay. Are we ready for a vote or there further discussion? Vote. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. For tabling. For tabling. All those opposed? Four to two passes. And I'll just make a comment, Mr. Chair. Um, the issue, you seem to indicate that you've offered us a lot of market information. It's not our job to, to digest that and, and come back with an impact uh, statement or study. That's your job. It's not the job of the school to look at data. And That's right. And we've given you all that information. We've come we're, to our we're conclusion. We're not supposed to write the impact study for you. Uh, I guess we've said it numerous times that it, 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 it's not an impact uh, study yet. Uh, and that's what you need to work on. I, I went through a mathematical sequence of what, uh, in, in basic terms, what it, what it uh, implies. Uh, but I'm said before, I'm not going to write it. Um, I guess I, I don't stand alone uh, in the issue that it's, uh, um, what you've provided so far doesn't um, reveal the impact of, of the subdivision on it. I guess I'm still at a loss. I <clears throat> don't know what else to be able to provide you. We've given you numbers, we've given you statistics, we've uh, given you I, I'll be blunt about it. Maybe you should hire somebody who knows how to write an impact. We've, we've asked Mark Ironman to do that. Okay. He's really the, and he literally said he's the only person he knows in this state who can do that. Yeah. And he, of course, has a conflict. <laughs> OK, 
Could, could I ask if there's other members of the board who share your concern, or is that simply, are you the only one who feels that way? Have, have we addressed the impact to the agreement, to the satisfaction of other members of the board? One, I, <clears throat> I don't think so. I mean, what I've seen, uh, we have, you've shown us what the impact on Department of Public Works is going to be. I'm not really sure if I feel comfortable with what the impact on the school department is really going to be. You know, from now, the future, and what have you. I just, I can't say that I've read something that makes me feel like, okay, that's been satisfied, I know what's going to happen, and the town has put on notice that you know, we've got a problem coming, it may be years down the road, but it's a problem coming, or maybe there's no problem coming. I'm just, I don't know that. Mr. Chair, I would like to offer my uh, take on these two issues, the dual issues of safety and community impact. And I think that the uh, spread, if you will, between the school impact submitted by the applicant in the first submittal and the uh, sort of, uh, if you will, uh, out of the database approach from the second and the range thereby indicated is probably as, uh, as close as one could get to actually crystal balling what the impact would be because if you go through the market profile report that was submitted for this meeting and you divide out the number of households and the number of children per average household and multiply it by the number of units, uh, you then have a much higher number of potential of students per house in this town and then one can undertake a philosophical analysis of whether or not new housing developments generate as many students per household as existing towns do uh, and know that somewhere in between what was originally submitted and what is given as the number of students per household in the town of Cape Elizabeth is where we'll probably eventually end up after 10 or 15 down, years down the road and I think that can be ascertained at this point without further lengthy analysis by the applicant. We know now that uh, given the uh, average number of students per household in this town, if we, as indicated in this report, that 100 houses are going to generate 200 students. Uh, we also know that given from all the other analysis of averages in other new subdivisions, that the applicant has said that we'd probably have somewhere around 100. I believe, or, or a little more than that, and we know that as time goes by, it you know, may likely be a, not neither one nor the other. So I think, uh, I think a little bit more, uh, if I change my sights to the uh, safety regarding the Rock and Gun Club, I think if something is just a little bit more specific in writing on that, uh, documenting angles and, and directions and practices. And distance. Um, we, and the distances we know from the plans. Why, why Amy uh, went out, we did make contact with a gun expert of the Kittery Trading Post. And we do have some information. I don't have it written for him yet other than the note she took. Uh, I guess it, it boils down to if someone was standing out there with a 306 pointing straight up in the air at a 45 degree angle going way over the top of this hill here, the bullet could travel for three miles. I, I think your application should be, should include information on current practices regarding safety at the gun club. And, and that should be documented for your own uh, benefit, I think, in this process. And I think that the uh, material that you submitted tonight indicating that in the, uh, in the deeds and in the plats that, that would be noticed, noted also, I, I think that, that was the, the basic step there. So. I, th I think it's uh, very, mm -hmm. you know, you're... It's, it's our understanding at the Rodden Gun Club that only people who are, are trained, who are law enforcement officers, are people who are allowed to, to shoot down there. There's not uh, mm -hmm. someone going down there for target practice or, or skeet shooting. Hmm. It's my understanding that that club has, I believe, 150 members. Not all of them use it, because a friend of mine is a, uh, is a member. And he did go shooting there until apparently there's a new range in Saco opened up a little while ago, and he has transferred his practice shooting down there. There's a number of people that use that, and you know it could be anyone from um, a father taking a son out to learn how to shoot, you know, with a, his first rifle, to um, 
because where else will you go? I mean, when I was a kid, we could go shooting a lot of different places in this town. You can't anymore. And so there has to be some place, and people can make mistakes. And if you look at where the um, Rodden Gun Club is in, <laughs> located in sort of in the crotch of the project, if you would use that term, um, you've got quite a wide, wide range of uh, areas that could be impacted. It's not just the houses and was a phase four. It could be any number of them, depending on the trajectory of the, of the bullet. So I think that needs to be addressed more fully if you have to cooperate with the Rudd and Gun, Rudd and Gun Club to get a higher berm build or something. I don't, I'm not sure what the answer is. But we need to have something to have the board be comfortable, and I think it's going to pay off in the long run for marketing to have addressed this issue up front. I, I think if, if, if you could be specific, for instance, regardless of the 45 degree angle from the three miles away, I'm concerned of, of you told me that's a 15 degree angle at 1,200 feet away. What's the velocity of a bullet to a 30 odd six at, at that distance? And is that velocity dangerous? Is it going to bounce off my forehead or is it going to kill me? Uh, that's what I'm interested in. Then, then it's up to the board to gauge. Is that a public safety uh, issue? How, how did the board deal with that when, when uh, Elizabeth Farms came before them? Was that an issue back then? I don't know. I think that even predates me. I wasn't on the board then. I don't, I don't think any of the members of the board were on, on the board then. The town planner wasn't here then. <laughs> or, you know, there's been other, there's been other subdivisions in, you know, say a two or three mile radius. That, that, what I'm saying, you keep going back to the two and three miles, that, that, that's not what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about the 1,200 feet away. Right. If somebody aims a 30 out six of me, uh, 1,200 feet away, or, uh, I think it'll hurt. But, uh, I'm concerned about public safety. If it is, what do we do about it? Well, then we make a decision. Um, yeah, that, that's three miles away. Yeah. A 30 out six would still cause injury. Terry, Terry, there's also a suspicion that I have that you might want to examine, and that is if a, if a shot clears the berm from a 30 odd six, it may end up, you know, on the other side of Spurwing and miss this subdivision entirely. I think that's, uh, you know, worth noting. Mm -hmm. and if, the if that's the case, we, you can't tell without probably looking at the you know, actual trajectories. Okay. I, I guess, Terry, what I'd like to suggest is I don't know a lot about how the particular gun club operates. And you've said that it's your understanding that such and such happens and whatnot. Uh, I guess what I'd like to really ask is that you do get, uh, do deliver us really some thorough treatment in writing about not only what the current practices are at the gun club, but what it has been doing for the last three years or five years or some period of time, because obviously we're talking about safety into the future and there's no uh, guarantee that what the current practices are will continue. But um, I'd like to have a very thorough understanding of what the practices are that go on at the gun club. And enough said, because I'm uh, in favor of the other comments on the board. Any other comments, Mr. Carlson? The, got, the running got the run, rod and gun club is there. It's going to stay there. Uh, I'm sure they take all the safety they possibly can because of insurance purposes and everything else. I really don't know what we can do to satisfy that that is safe for the development. Period. There's always going to be the element of carelessness or uh, not knowing what you're doing. So I don't know where we could stop on this. I don't, you know, the answer might be to put a two-mile berm around the rod and gun club, and then they're in there. But I don't know what can be done to, quote, make the rod and, rod and gun club safe to this development or any other development in the area. Thank you. Anything further? Thank you. We'll be back next month.
Okay, the first item under new business is Ramshead Subdivision Amendment, requested by John Higgins and Nano Chatfield for amendments to the previously approved Ramshead Subdivision to install underground utilities, relocate a proposed road, and enlarge an existing pond, section 16-2-5, Subdivision Amendment, and section 19-3-9, what Wetlands Alteration Permit, completeness of public hearing. changed employment about six months ago and uh, there are a couple of ongoing projects that are before the board that uh, are currently uh, either partly or somewhat more than partly being involved uh, has been involved land use consultants with whom I'm currently uh, employed so I certainly have a conflict of interest on the uh, two next agenda items uh, would the board prefer that I come back and uh, recuse myself uh, formally at the next item or shall I just uh, disappear until uh, the lot and public access waiver I think it's already on the record, so I don't think you need to come back. Okay. Thank you. Um, the Ramshead subdivision was approved by the Planning Board in 1993, four lots at the very end of Charles E. Jordan Road. Um, after the subdivision was uh, approved, the, the, it was sold, and a subsequent owner uh, took a, an existing pond on the site and made uh, alterations outside of what was approved by the Planning Board. Uh, the, the subdivision was sold as a whole unit again to the current applicant and they are coming forward to request changes, amendments to the existing subdivision approval. They're also asking for uh, wetlands alteration permit to uh, more, uh, more effectively restore the pond and also restore, uh, expand the size of the pond and there are some other amendments that are being proposed to the subdivision application. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Warren. Thank you. Good evening, board members. I'm here this evening on behalf of the applicants, uh, John uh, Higgins and Nana Chatfield. John's with me here this evening. What I'd like to do is just take about five minutes and walk you through the subdivision plan amendments and the wetlands alterations issues, and then um, turn it back to the board for discussion. I think Maureen gave you a very good uh, summary in the packets that came out to you. We have five issues that we're looking for board to the board to review and approve for amendments this evening. They are fairly straightforward. I'll walk you through um, some of the simpler ones. At the time that the plan was originally approved, the town requested a bond for underground utilities, but the plan showed overhead utilities um, as approved by the board. We're seeking to clarify that and tell you that we want to place the utilities underground within the easements. And then, once the utilities are underground, remove the main overhead power lines that come down into the property. And that area, right now, the overhead power line comes in, crosses the pond, and serves the house. What we propose to do is run the new underground power down the easement and in, and we provided you with the locations of the transformers, and have been working with CMP to work out the alignment of that. So that's the first amendment we're asking you to consider. The second one is actually quite beneficial, at least from our point of view, because we're straightening out what was formerly a bit of an awkward piece of the right-of-way up at the top of the subdivision. Those of you who were involved with this in 1993 remember that the uh, alignment as approved wove around in two type turns down at the end of my finger um, a couple of barns and structures. Those have been taken down. And what we're proposing is simply to straighten out that easement. So instead of coming in and making a right-hand turn uh, that was about an 80-degree turn and then swinging and making another 80-degree turn and then turning back again for about a 40-degree turn, it's simply now a straight shot into the subdivision. 
I had talked about this with Chief McGoldrick early on, and he was in favor of that, and um, his memo only mentions the dry hydrant. So that was our major consideration in terms of improving safety. The other piece that's been considered here and been talked about for about a year is the addition of an easement running along Lot 4 and passing over the area of Lot 4 and connecting into a budding land of Spray Corporation. As Maureen has pointed out in a memo, what we're looking to do on that right now is simply get the paperwork done and create that on this amended plan. In the future, should Mr. Higgins or the Spray Corporation decide to interconnect some of the utilities, either uh, water supply or um, underground communications or power, then the easement exists and they can simply come back and rather than go through a plan amendment, they can request the required special permits because of the location of that easement. It's in the uh, shoreland zone. It's also, with, also within uh, critical wetlands. So they need to come back for a permit from you to do work within the easement. So what we're asking the board to do this evening is simply approve the addition of that easement to the plan with the recognition that when that work occurs, what would have to happen is they would make another application back to the board not for a subdivision amendment, but strictly for whatever permits were required under site plan or um, shoreland or wetlands for that specific construction operation. The other piece that um, we're asking the board to consider this evening is the addition of wing walls down on the existing bridge. Right now, the bridge crosses down by the original spray house at the end of the pond and provides access from the road down into the house. The bridge had been deteriorating. Um, some had fallen in. We've been doing repair work, and we approached the codes officer about doing some buttressing on the pond and doing some uh, buttressing on the bridge, excuse me, and doing some work um, to repair the culvert. In the subsequent activities between the code enforcement officer and ourselves, it was determined that because the wing walls were an expansion of the structure from that original plan, we needed to bring that to you as an amendment to the subdivision plan. And what's being proposed on that was to simply extend two wings off the pond side of the bridge abutment itself, because what's been poured along the bridge abutment is a new concrete reinforced structure that will provide an overflow outlet for the pond and then also buttress the, uh, the bridge itself. The last piece that we're asking the board to consider, though, um, with the uh, plat are just some changes on the notes. In the original subdivision approval, the plan had a note 16, which indicated that the road between this section here and down here um, would be loamed and seeded definitively. And what we wanted to say was that we're going to keep some of that gravel, but we're also going to possibly loam and seed it. Part of that issue depends on some larger considerations of rights of way that other parties have in that area. So we wanted to be crystal clear with the board and indicate that we're going to make an effort and try to loan and see that. But de definitively, um, we've clarified it in note 20 that um, it may be reestablished to lawn. And that's still subject to um, other considerations. Those are the five plan amendments that they're asking, we're asking the board to consider. The other piece that we're asking the board to look at this evening is something that we discussed with you back at a workshop uh, a little over 30 days ago. And that is we're proposing to make some changes to the pond that exists out um, in the center of all the properties. What has transpired down there is that the previous owner, um, prior to Nano and John having or taking ownership of this, had gone in, as Maureen said, and basically demolished the pond, dredged the bottom, and hacked up the sides. In the process of negotiating with Army Corps and DEP, a restoration plan was prepared and partially installed. When John purchased the property, he agreed to move forward with that restoration plan. When we looked at it, we also brought in um, eco-analysts and Albert Frick to examine the pond. And we felt that the restoration work that had been done was inappropriate. It wasn't getting to the essence of what DEP and Army Corps were looking for. Secondarily, the water quality issues and the types of wetlands that were there weren't really going to function to the benefit of the pond in terms of erosion control and water quality maintenance. 
And we also were asking John and Anna to consider a larger body to give a little greater volume for storage, but also to take care of some water temperature and habitat issues. Consequently, we're coming back to the board tonight asking for a special wetlands permit to expand the pond by about 7,500 square feet. And that's the area shown shaded here on the subdivision plan. We are doing work in that area specifically to create a shallower shelf running back up into the slope and regrading the slope so that we can get more of an emergent wetland and redevelop some of the substrate area that was lost in the original um, demolition or, or um, regrading of the pond basin. Secondarily, we're looking at the bridge abutment as restoring that pond elevation back up to where it used to be. If you've been down there and seen the pond in the past five or six years, the pond level has been dropping because the dam breast has been gradually disintegrating and snapping off. It's an older concrete and stone structure. What we're looking to do is rebuild that and then raise that pond elevation back up to give us another 18 inches, give us more water volume, give us a little greater water body, but essentially take it back to that elevation of 14.7, which is what it appears to be from the old photographs and from the um, sources and watermark that are in that area. It is about a 30% increase. I think we're going from 14,500 to 22,000 um, square feet in area. And as a result of this, we will be putting back in place the wetlands that were lost as part of the original dredging operation. And that, in summary, is what we're looking to do in that pond. Raise the water, expand the basin, and then reshape and regrade those side slopes and then replant them. Right now, if, you're at, if you go out there and look, some of the plantings have been moved um, by John and Nano. They've been replanting on areas that we have regraded back to the original restoration plan and what uh, this town and the DEP and Army Corps were considering. But we've held off any work on these sides pending review by this board. What that's going to take, though, is, as Maureen spelled out in her memo, we're asking that the board move for consideration of complete this, this evening and then um, consider actually having the hearing this evening on this application. In our information submitted to you is a letter from Sprague Corporation. They are the only abutter on this. Obviously, there's been a lot of conversation between John and the Sprague Corporation, um, not only about the pond, but also because of the necessity of the right-of-way changes. So they're well aware of the issues, and I think if you've read that, you know that they don't have tremendous concerns about that in terms of moving forward. So I know that we're asking um, a lot from the board this evening in terms of moving some things along. But um, the changes on the plan are fairly minor. These are alterations that really reflect changes in ownership. And we've highlighted on the plans each of those changes and then resubmitted the entire subdivision set. So there's three plats, the three plans that you would sign, and then the eight backup plans. And I think I've spoken enough, so I'll turn it over to the board. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I believe we, the first thing we have to do is um, determine that the uh, project is complete. And <coughs> according to the Weapons Alteration Permit Application Completeness Checklist that's in our package, uh, it certainly seems that there's a great discussion about that. None for me. Certainly seemed complete to me. Mm -hmm. It was a very thorough application. Okay, so then are we in motion? Can you I'd have like a motion to as to the completeness? Sure. I'd like to move that the application be deemed complete. I'll second the motion. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous. Okay. Um, time for either comments, questions, or what have you. First comment has to do with the applicant's request to, for for a uh, for public hearing tonight. I, I don't even know if we're allowed to do that. Uh, whether the Sprague Corporation fully fits uh, the bill as the sole abutter by the technical definition. Perhaps a plan. Well, when, the, when the applicant made this request, I, I spoke to the chair about it, and um, he agreed to entertain the request. So when we sent out the 
when the board has an item on the agenda for the first time, we send notices to all the all the neighbors. And um, for this meeting, the notice also said that there might be a public hearing scheduled. So we tried to cover that. Mm -hmm. I have gotten a call from two different people, not in the Sprague Corporation, that were interested in the project and told them what was going on, that there might be a public hearing, and they both expressed no concerns at all. To whom was the notice mailed in terms of the, the notice is mailed to everyone within, actually, at least within 500 feet of the project. And who was that with respect to this project? Um, I have a list in the package if you'd like to see it. But more than the Sprague Corporation? More than, absolutely. We, we tend to over rather than under notice, so it was more than just the Sprague Corporation. But they are the, the, the vast majority of the land is spray corporation land within 500 feet of this parcel. Do you feel that, that by mentioning the possibility of public hearing, we uh, satisfy the legal requirement for notice? Yes, I do. Because it, we would have just mailed the, the same notice to people, the exact same people again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How does the board feel about the public hearing? I think as long as we comply legally with, with the requirement, I have no problem with go ahead and opening up public hearing tonight. Okay. Is that the consensus of the board? Yes, I guess I'd like to say it is highly unusual, but if, uh, you know, if it's within the, uh, the requirements, I see no damage to be done if the um, if everybody to whom the notice was sent has already been notified that there could be a possibility of a public hearing, we've had no request for postponement. So. <clears throat> public hearing is, uh, is open. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak? Seeing none, public hearing. Okay, are we on to more detailed discussion? Mr. Chair, uh, as far as the, the five items uh, which are, are minor, um, I have no problem with those. I think it probably should be mentioned to the, to the general public so they understand that this applicant came to a workshop and discuss these issues, so it's not as the case that we're taking all of this information in um, in a fairly short period of time. We've, we've had a chance to have this introduced to us prior, um, and it should be noted that you know, no decisions are made at a workshop, so it was a case that was simply explained to us at that time. It's pretty unusual. Um, it is a very complete package. Um, I actually, believe it or not, have no, no questions. <laughs> Who's laughing out there? <laughs> Uh, Mr. Wilcox? Uh, no, I have not. Ms. McKay? I'd like to compliment the applicant on the thoroughness of the, of the presentation. Um, and I don't have uh, any concerns that were not already raised by the town engineer. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Mr. Johnson, no questions here? No, this is a, <coughs> <it's really coughs> a rapid item. Um, I have a motion. If yeah, you, if, do you have I'm a, ready. I have a motion for the um, board to consider findings of fact. John Higgins and Nano Chatfield are requesting amendments to the previously approved Ramshead subdivision and a wetland alteration permit, which require planning board review. Two, the original approval required the installation of a dry hydrant in the existing pond as a water supply during a fire emergency. Three, proposed changes to the original subdivision plan should maintain and enhance fire protection for the subdivision. Four, the application substantially complies with section 16-2-5, amendment to a previously approved subdivision in section 19-3-9, wetland regulation. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of John Higgins and Nano Chatfield for amendments to the Ramshead subdivision, located at the end of Charles E. Jordan Road, and a wetland alteration permit be approved with the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised to comply with the Fire Chief's memorandum dated July 10, 1996. And two, that there be no alteration of the site until the plans, the plans have been appropriately revised and submitted to the town planner. 
I'll second the motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous. Thank you. Excuse me. The next item under new business is a uh, Highland Subdivision Amendment request by Greater Portland Development Group slash Peter Kennedy for an amendment to the Highland Subdivision to re relocate the water line and lengthen the gravel portion of the emergency access road. Section 16-2-5, amendment to a previously approved subdivision. As in the past, um, I have to pass on this particular agenda item and I will step down from the podium. And Ms. McKay, would you please take the chair? I'd like to ask the town planner to give us an introduction to why we're here this time. Uh, the subdivision is the Highland subdivision. The planning board approved amendments to this in February of 1996. Amendments to subdivisions which also amend the recording plat are required to be recorded within 90 days in the Cumberland County Registry or they are deemed null and void in our ordinance. Uh, the approval was, appro was recorded on the 92nd day and our town attorney has determined that it is therefore null and void. The applicant has returned this evening for a reapproval of that which was originally approved February 20th. Thank you. Um, Mr. Moore? I didn't really think <clears throat> that I would be back here again on the Broad Cove project. Mm -hmm. um, however, as Maureen has mentioned, um, for a number of reasons, and I spell those out in my submission letter to you. The plan did not get recorded until the 92nd day. Um, it's unfortunate because the pre-construction meeting had already happened. The bonds and the other paperwork were in place for the construction, and it was intended that that work was going to go forward uh, back in June. And what we're asking for tonight is simply the board's approval or reapproval <coughs> of that plat and um, we will take care of getting that recorded once Maureen has checked the plan <coughs> and the board has had a chance to uh, sign off on the plan itself. Karen Walsh is here with me this evening. Um, she works with Peter. If you have any specific questions about the plan or the recording or where things will go from here. Um, but I think Maureen has pointed out to you that it's a reapproval of the plan. As previously shown, we're not proposing any changes or amendments to the plan. Um, we're asking the board to reapprove it so that we can move forward with the construction as envisioned by the original plan. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go any further, I'd just like to ask the town planner to um, tell us how this meeting was noticed and whether the abutters have gotten notice and that sort of thing. As a new item on the planning board agenda, a notice was sent to everyone within, within at least 500 feet of the project. They were notified that this was a, 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 a reapproval and that there would probably be no public hearing at this meeting. Thank you. Any board member have any comments? Mr. Edson? I guess uh, my major concern is, is um, sort of walk back through why this thing fell apart again. Um, through the plan, do you have a copy of the March, would it be the March meeting? No, the, the February, February meeting. February 20. Yeah. Do you have those minutes there? I don't have them. I can get them if you want. I, I guess maybe the, uh, maybe yeah. Steve Moore remembers, but I mean, I, uh, my recollection was that there were certain dates that you had assured us certain pieces of work were to have started. Um, and I think of my recollection that dealt primarily with uh, the alteration of the, uh, the wetlands by the, the is it a sewer or water line? Waterline. Um, do you recollect, Steve, what that date was that you said that we were going to, you gave us a date you were going to be able to start and a date that you felt that that, that was going to be complete? Because that was an issue with, with uh, getting well, in and, and out of that project. It was. We had a fixed timeline. 
mm -hmm. of about 62 or 65 days that we were targeting that functioned primarily around the water line construction. And that was based on the Portland Water District and uh, Coleman, R.E. Coleman, who is mm -hmm. the contractor for this. And we had a specific timeline based on wetland conditions, but also um, disruption of that area and reconnection of the water line. What we had indicated to you, what I indicated to you at that meeting was that we anticipated that construction would begin, I think it was about two and a half or three weeks after the meeting, and that we would be finished by the end of June, that everything would be completed and graded and wrapped up um, by the middle of the summer. We're still looking at that same kind of timeline in terms of construction, and there were a couple of issues that slowed down the actual um, securing and posting and recording of that plan, the first of which was getting the final bond amount and figure set and back into the town and approved. The second one was we lost a little bit of time due to a conflict of uh, potential consideration of conflict of interest between the bank's attorney and the town attorney, who are in fact one. And then Peter was out of town. So that slowed that process down. When he got back, we had the pre-construction meeting, and then the plan was recorded on the 92nd day. So Peter himself was out of town um, until mid-June? Okay. Until um, the 22nd, basically I guess somebody else w was accountable then to, to make sure that they could start on, on time. The other issue I think dealt with um, this elongated pond, uh, which was supposed to be a drainage ditch uh, near the Boxers residence. Uh, do you remember the time frame uh, of when that was supposed to start and be completed? That was within, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the earlier part of that time frame. So it was anticipated that that was going to be done in May, May of 96. And, and, and the same excuses as, as to why that wasn't done then? Construction didn't start. We didn't, yeah, no, never got to the, the same reason. Same, same reason, yeah. yes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'd like to just, I'm um, consulting the um, February 20th minutes, which the efficient town planner has uh, produced for us. And the, happy to, to let you see these, but let me just respond briefly to what you um, raised. It says that Mr. Cotter asked about a prospective completion date on the infrastructure, water, road, paving, drainage, etc. Mr. Moore responded, they hope to get the heavy work done no later than May. They want to get the initial seating by mid-May. Paving should be done sometime in the summer. 